Good morning. I'm going to try something new again. And all of this past how many for many weeks have been new. Everything we try um, is geared toward helping us get together. So I'm going to try something new and uh, we'll see how it goes. And you let me know. Okay? You'll figure it out. Um, in just a second. I have um, a lesson this morning on the Aaronic Priesthood for the type of Christ this morning from Leviticus. And so if you'll have your lesson that I sent to you on your email, check your email, make sure that I'm in your contact so it doesn't get sent to spam or trash or whatever you have um, where unknown senders get sent. So look for your email every week and I have some pictures again. So uh, take a look at that, have your Bible ready and we'll get started. Let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we get to spend with our sisters in Christ and I pray that you would bless our hearts as we study your word this morning be with the prayer requests that are on each heart we'll um, share them with each other and pray for each other just like you want us to and we thank you for your word we thank you for your love and we pray that you would be with us services today in Jesus name we pray amen all right Christ in the whole Bible and um, we talked last week about the fact that Hebrews was a commentary on the book of Leviticus and so we do use a lot of scriptures from Hebrews um, today and we're gonna start with Hebrews 8 1 through 7 and that's just our kicking off point and uh, let's read it together. Hebrews 8, 1 through 7. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throat of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every pre high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifice. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. And we're talking about our high priest, Christ. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Now Christ is the mediator of the better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. All right, we're going to be talking about the sacrifices that the priests made um, and how the priests were ordained to offer those sacrifices, but they were not faultless. But Christ is, and so he um, fulfilled the law in himself and the sacrifice that he gave on the cross for our sins. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Specifically, we're going to be talking about how the priest and the high priest and the other priests of Aaron's family were a type of Christ. In Hebrews 5.1, it gives us a definition of a priest because he is the mediator between God and man representing man to God 
For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And that's what the priest was supposed to do. Now, the Aaronic priesthood is the one that because God called him out of all the other tribes, he called it Levites, the tribe of Levi. And then from the tribe of Levi, he called Aaron and his family to be the priests. They were consecrated, they were cleansed, and they were clothed with special um, cleansing, special consecration, and special clothing for the work that God had given them. And um, the chapters in 7 and 8 talk about that in the book of Leviticus. The consecration, they were set apart for the work that God had called them. Does that remind you of Christ? It should. Because Christ was come to do the will of him that sent me, he said. And to do the will of the Father. And made several references throughout his ministry here on earth. That that's what he came to earth to do. And then uh, the cleansing part of the calling and the consecration and the setting apart was uh, twofold. The cleansing for the priests was at the altar of sacrifice where they had to offer sacrifices for their own sins. Um, they had to be clean and holy because God is holy. And then they were representing man before God and so they had to be clean because that was the whole purpose of the sacrifices and offerings. And so uh, then there's a second part of the cleansing, and that was at the laver, the brazen laver that was outside the door of the holy of holies and holy place was where the um, priest did his washing before he did any sacrifices and before he went into the um, holy place or the holy of holies. Now, that reminds us that Christ didn't have to be cleansed from his sin or before he went into the presence of God because Christ was perfect. He was holy because he was God. He was uh, had no sin and neither was guile found in his mouth. And But God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the cleansing is kind of like a type in the opposite um, to me. That's what it seems like to me. And then um, the... verse in Ephesians 5 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it and that's talking about the church that's talking about us that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word and so that reminds us of the the cleansing that we need and Christ did it for us in his word and we just have to apply it to our lives by reading his word and then John 13 10 Jesus saith unto him he that is washed he's talking to Peter needeth not to save to wash his feet but is clean every whit and ye are clean but not all remember when uh, Peter was saying Lord you, sh you shouldn't wash my feet I mean and Jesus told him I know I need to wash your feet that's part of the the cleansing and so Peter said well just cleanse wash my whole body then and he's no that's not necessary you are cleansed it's just the washing the regeneration the renewing that you need once you come out of the world day by day or to have the meal with me that you need your feet washed and um, he said so he that is washed or he that is saved Needeth not save to wash his feet, be renewed, be regenerated, day by day. 
and you are clean every whit except for one of you. And he was talking about Judas, of course, at that point. And so that is the cleansing part. Um, it's still, still a type of Christ. And then the clothing of the priests and the high priest was to reflect the holiness of God, for one thing, because most everything was white, uh, especially for the priests. And it is supposed to represent the holiness of God. And that reminds us also of the robes of Christ when we see pictures of him even in the New Testament uh, and in, especially in Revelation. And it reminds us of Christ being a, a lamb without spot or blemish. And then we are clothed in robes made white with righteousness. And then the um, book of Revelation talks about those who come through the tribulation whose robes are washed in the blood of the lamb and they become white. Um, so let's talk about each one of those. Consecration, cleansing, and the clothing. First, the consecration. That's, again, it's uh, described in the book of Leviticus. And um, he talks about consecration and he gives Moses certain commandments in regards to that. And those commandments, uh, you shall command, you shall command, you shall command. He mentions that 12 times. He uses the word command 12 times. Um, the priests wore a coat, a belt, a robe, an ephod, or the high priest, I'm sorry, a coat, a belt, a robe, an ephod, or an ephod, or I've heard it pronounced several different ways, a breastplate, a mitre, which is their bonnet or like turban around their head, and then the crown for the high priest, because there's an extra set of gold rim around the turban for the high priest. Um, the priests just wore the, um, the coat and the belt or the sash or the girdle and a robe so that they were, they were just uh, in white from head to toe and then a mitre. Then the um, high priest added the crown, the gold crown, the ephod, and the breastplate. And then there was oil that was involved, and Aaron had to gather all of this material to be ready for the day of consecration for uh, himself and the priests. And um, well, he told, God told Moses to have them all gathered together like that. They had to get oil because oil was used in the consecration and in offerings and sacrifices many times. It was either sprinkled or poured on everything in the tabernacle to make it holy. And then on the priests themselves. And then um, coats and belts and bonnets, like I said, for Aaron's sons, for the priests. Then they had to offer their own sin offering before the people could even be brought into the tabernacle to offer their sin offerings. The blood was put on the horns of the altar because the horns of the brazen altar just inside the uh, the tent around the set up the tabernacle, not in the holy place or the holy of holies, but the outer tent, the outer perimeter fence, I should say. Um, they had to put blood on the horns of the altar and then poured the blood at the bottom of the altar to purify the altar, to sanctify it, and to make reconciliation because with, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. The Bible tells us that over and over. And then they um, offered a bull as an offering and it's, they offered it just the same way the, the children of Israel offered their bullocks. The same directions, um, the same directions for the burnt offering of the ram and the consecration ram that was offered. It was a separate ram, a sec second ram. And that was all, with all of the, the priests putting their hands on the head of the animals to identify 
their sins with that sacrifice. And they were say, signifying that they are putting their sins on that animal to be sacrificed. And we have to identify ourselves as Christ taking our redemption for sins. It's not enough to believe in Christ. We have to put our identification in him saying, Lord, I know I've sinned. Please take my sins upon you as you died on the cross. And I accept that sacrifice for my sins. And I believe that that's why you did it. That's why you died was to pay the penalty for my sin. We have to be identified with the crucifixion of Christ. Um, in Psalm 38, in Psalm 40, and verse 12, it's talking about how the sin we have is over our head, or talking about the number of hairs we have on our head as far as our sin is concerned, and that goes back to the picture that we have of Aaron, or the people of uh, God, the children of Israel, and the priests, and the high priest, putting their hands on the head of the animal that is to be sacrificed. It's talking about how much sin there is on the head and that they are not hidden from God. So um, blood was applied in uh, the consecration of the priests to their um, right ear, their right thumb, and their right big toe. And you might think that's weird, but if you think about even the little preschool song that we sang when we were little bitty kids, saying, oh, be careful little eyes, what you see, oh, be careful little ears, oh, be careful hands and feet. It's talking, it's a little bit about that because it's talking about the holiness of God. The ears are to, they are to hear the word of God for their people and hear what God wanted in their lives. We need to consecrate our ears to hear what God wants us to hear. And God spoke to Christ, and Christ heard what God wanted him to do, and he did it. Our hands are consecrated to do the work of God, and our feet to do the will of God, our ears, our, our whole body. And that's why it was signifying with the um, priests being consecrated with the blood of the sacrifice on their ear and their thumb and their toe. And then they did a wave offering. They filled their hands, but then they had their hands outstretched for what God would fill them with. And then the oil and the blood was applied to Aaron and his sons to, to signify the holiness that God wanted on their lives. God was very, very strict about the holiness in their lives that he wanted. Um, and then they talked about the food of the priests, all within that consecration chapter. They were to boil the ram that they sacrificed and eat it with the bread of consecration in the door of the tabernacle. And then all the leftovers were to be burned on the altar. Then seven days of separation followed that consecration. Seven days of separation before they got outside the tabernacle to mingle with the rest of the children of Israel. Now this was the initial um, consecration of God calling the Aaron and his sons as priests. Um, this was a one-time thing as far as the seven days of separation. Um, and they, it, well, you think of that as seven representing a number of completion. Um, like the seven days of creation and God rested on the seventh day for the completion. And the holy days, there are seven holy days with the children of Israel, seven different kinds. There were seven churches in the book of Revelation. Um, there are other sevens in Revelation, the seven vials, the seven books, the seven trumpets. 
There were seven statements on the cross. And then remember when the disciples were asking Jesus, well, how many times should I forgive somebody that's wronged me? Seven times or 70 times? And Jesus was saying, well, 70 times seven. And not 490 times, he was saying, but as many times as possible. It all had to do with sevens. So um, seven was a, a, a number of completion in the Bible. Now, if you were a, a part of the children of Israel, you had to go many, many, many times to the tabernacle, to the courtyard, offer your sacrifices for sins, and you would be very familiar with the whole process, with the things that you did, the things that um, the children, the, the priests did, and the things that the high priest did. So uh, it's something different for us, but it's still something that pictures the role that Christ had in our lives or has in our lives. And let's talk about, um, for instance, the Day of Atonement. Now, on the Day of Atonement, you um, prepare by fasting that day and the children, the, the priests purified the temple or the tabernacle. And uh, they went through all, the whole process of the, all these sacrifices that the children of Israel were gonna do individually, but they had to do it ahead of time um, for the tabernacle to be sanctified and for themselves to be sanctified. But if you were a, ch um, a child of Israel, you would come into the gate with a perfect sacrifice, one without spot or blemish, like Christ was for us, the animal would be slain before, just inside the door, the gate of the tabernacle, uh, before you went any further, and you placed your hand on the head of the sacrifice, identifying yourself as that animal that sh should be sacrificed. You should die for your sins. You should be the one that was sacrificed for our sins, but God made a way for the children of Israel and God made a way for us through Christ. The sacrifice and the blood was on the altar of um, the brazen altar and they did a sin offering and a burnt offering and Aaron on the day of atonement um, takes blood with him and coals from the fire and he's washed from the laver and he enters the holy place where a special incense is burning continually. It can't, it's, it, it's always burning when the tabernacle is set up. Um, where the oil and the lamps are, are continually burning. It must be continually burning all the time they are um, stationary and the tabernacle is set up. He passes the table of showbread with the manna. He goes through the veil that's between the holy place and the holy of holies and he only does this once a year and he brings incense to put on the fire that's in there uh, well he brings the fire from the coals of the altar and he sprinkles the blood of our sacrifice as the person who brought the sacrifice to the uh, tabernacle on the mercy seat seven times there's another seven for us and he had, he's already gone through all of that process while he is, while he was um, consecrating himself before this Day of Atonement and for the, uh, his family. Because he had to offer sacrifices for himself as well and his family. And while he was in there, he was in there to do a job. He was not to sit down. He was not to dilly-dally, as my mom would say or dawdle and he went in he offered the sac the incense on the coals that he brought with him he sprinkled the blood and then he left he was to always keep moving there were no chairs 
in the Holy of Holies to sit down and rest, no matter how tired the high priest might be. He enters that room, the Holy of Holies, only on the Day of Atonement, which was once a year. And that rolled back the sin of the people for another year. And they had to do this continually, year after year. But when Christ came, listen to this. Christ is our high priest. And in Hebrews 7, 24 through 27, listen to this explanation of Christ as our high priest on the Day of Atonement, which was the day of crucifixion. But this man, Christ, because he continueth ever, there was no start to him, there was no end to him, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did, Christ did, once when he offered up himself. Praise the Lord. That was Hebrews 7, 24 through 27. And Christ's work as, his high, as the high priest, our high priest, is finished. Listen to this verse from Luke 22, 69. Hereafter, after this is done, the sacrifice on the cross, shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. And his work is done. It is finished. That was the seventh saying that Christ made on the cross. It is finished. It is done. His blood is on the mercy seat in heaven. And we are cleansed from our sins forever. Once and for all. Oh, brother, believe it. Once and for all, O oh sinner, believe it. Amen and amen. All right, I am so happy you are with us today. And um, I hope to see you in some live services very soon. If you are with us this morning, then I will see you there. And if you are waiting for the 65 and older, I'll see you then. And if you are waiting for a safe time, no matter what your age, I will see you then. I love you.